Welcome. We're on the road to another little bit of descriptive analytics, this time thinking about numerical data. But before we go to the PowerPoint, some people have uh, asked about my nice shirt that I'm wearing. This is a shirt from East Timor, which uh, is, uh, the students of mine will know that are not particularly big, but this is a extra large because people in East Timor tend to be relatively small. So uh, um, always make sure you oversize your purchase. Okay, enough of me. Let's start getting into some more interesting, more boring matters depending on how you look at it. We're going to think together about describing data still. Descriptive analytics is the area that we're in. And we're going to be thinking particularly in this case about describing and numerical data. So if you recall, data is of different types and we're now operating on this side of the chart. So looking at numerical data, data which can be captured by numbers effectively, whether that's counts of things or measures of things. Here is an example of some data. What I'm going to do actually is click across to PowerPoint now to show you this data here that you see right in front of me and uh, we'll um, come back to the PowerPoint in just a moment. This is some data that was collected some time ago on uh, visits to the doctor. So you have a bunch of people that uh, have been surveyed and uh, each person has got an ID number and then we collect a whole lot of information about them. Just to give you an idea about how many people we've got, you can see if I scroll down here, it goes on and on. We've got quite a few people. Might just get down a bit quicker. There we go. We've got oh, we're already up to over a thousand. So it looks like we've got about twelve hundred or so, twelve hundred and twenty-two rows. So minus the header row, twelve hundred and twenty-one data points. Twelve hundred and twenty-one people who were surveyed. In each case, we collected a bunch of information from each of these people hopefully in some kind of random representative sample. And so first first person we talked to was 48 years old. And the data we've got, it's very important whenever you've got any data to know something about the units of the data. So what we have here is the number of times this person went to the doctor in the last three months. So this person didn't go at all. Uh, they have 40 and a half years of schooling, education. It's a uh, male. That's indicated by the one there. So if you scroll down, you see this person here is a is a zero. That's a female, but this person's a male. That's their monthly income. And this is the season in which we were questioning this person. So was it summer, autumn, winter, or spring? And this person was surveyed in summer. And so on. So we've got a whole bunch of data points, exactly the same structure in each case. Let's take a, a different looking one. Here we've got a person who's 28 years old went to the doctor once in the last three months. That's how much education they've got, 13 years. So they've just finished school in a bit. Uh, it's a female. She earns $3,000 a month. And uh, she was surveyed in spring. So uh, different time of year to the first one. And so on. So that's what data can actually look like. And I've just got it here in the PowerPoint. Just a snapshot of some of that data. And uh, what we're interested in doing is taking those so some of those data there represent uh, numerical data. Um, I'll actually highlight which ones we're talking about in that respect. So we might be interested in you know, some kind of way of capturing this information about doctor's visits or about how much schooling people have or how much income they earn or whatever, or what their age distribution is. All of those are numerical data that we're interested in summarising. We have to be able to capture or summarise that in some way or other because otherwise you've just got this big column, as you saw there, massive column, lots and lots of data. It's actually quite hard to get much feel for what's going on with it unless you can summarise it somewhere. So the main thing we're interested in with this data is how many times people go to the doctor. So uh, in that case, one of the best ways of doing that is by putting it into what we call a frequency distribution. And we put the data, which take, takes many possible values. Some people go to the doctor is never one time, two times, three times, up to 12 times, in fact. In fact, more than 12. And so there's just too many, too many data points to sort of capture everything. What we do is we put together a distribution and we put people in categories. So this particular thing here is not the best laid out, but it's sort of partly a result of the way the spreadsheet program Excel does things. And obviously, if we're presenting this in some kind of report, we might make it a bit clearer. But this is what we do is we categorize people into those that never went to the doctor, those that went between one and three times. So these are the upper limits of the categories. So four to six, seven to nine, 10 to 12, and then this one you might say is greater than 12. So that's what I'd write if I was doing this nicely. So you can see that we've got about 1,200 people altogether. The most common 
range is between one, two, or three times. So somewhere between once a month and once every three months. It's a three-month period. Uh, quite a good number of the people uh, didn't go to the doctor at all, about, about over a third. And then there's a few who went a lot. Three months is about 13 weeks. So these people, these 25 people here went to the doctor basically at least once a week or thereabouts. So the first point we would make about that data is it's not actually that good to present the data that way. We're better off presenting it in some kind of percentage terms. So I could convert all these numbers into percentages easily enough. If I wanted to do that in Excel, there's a couple of clicks, but if I wanted to do that by hand, if I add up these numbers, I believe there's 1,221 of them. That's right. And uh, so the percentage here, I calculate simply as each of the values divided by 1,221. So 4, 6, 4 on 12, sorry, keep on pressing my right mouse button by mistake, 21 times 100 would give me the percentage there. And then I repeat that 519 on 1221. So roughly speaking, I'm going to get about 30-something uh, percent, 35 percent or thereabouts for the percentage for people who've never been to the doctor in the last three months. Okay, I assume you know how to work out percentages, so I won't dwell on that. Now, a little variation on the theme is instead of actually just getting distributions of probably the proportion in each category, we actually accumulate those distributions. So that's what we've got here. So now we've got the number of people, this is the first category, so that's the same. The number of people who went to the doctor no times was 464. And that represents 38% of the total. When we go, I said 35 on the previous page, it was actually 38. Quite enough. This category here is people who went to the doctor in either the first category, which is no times, or the second category, so between one and three times. So this actually represents up to three visits to the doctor. So it could be three, could be two, could be one, or it could include zero. So that number there is the previous cumulative, 464 plus 519. 464 plus 519. Then six represents the number of people who went to the doctor anywhere from zero to six times. So that's 983 plus 146, and so on. So you'll see here, the final category has to be 100%. Everybody went to the doctor in some amount of time, since this is an open-ended category. But 98% of people went to the doctor 12 times or less. Now you can see there that, that, that you get a bit of a picture now about what the sort of distribution of that is. 81% of people made visits to the doctor of three, one, at least at, at the most once a month. So that's kind of giving you a bit of a feel for not just how many people go to the doctor on how many times people go to the doctor on average. That's one number that we'll get to in some future lecture. But just what's the sort of distribution around it? The vast majority of people go at the most once a month. Now that same data we could capture in some kind of histogram if we wanted to. So it's exactly the same information as what we had in our first frequency distribution here. These categories now have been made into a bar chart, effectively. Um, and it, it's just a more helpful way sometimes visually to represent that. So you see, you can see the information there, but it's actually even easier to see really strikingly that people going to the doctor three times or less, either this category or this category here, represents the vast majority of people. And there's a reasonable number there, and then it drops off very quickly. Hardly anybody goes to the doctor more than six times, effectively. Just a very small percentage. So the histogram kind of gives you a visual way of capturing that. Now, just a little point about histograms. Histograms are just like frequency distributions, but they are only done for numerical data, whereas you can do a frequency table, uh, bar chart for categorical data as well. But when we do it for this numerical data like this, we call it a histogram. And it's also important that there are no gaps between the bars. In a histogram. If you think about a, a bar chart like you might see before, this, each of these bars here might represent different categories. But that's what a, a table might look like for a categorical. Bar chart. So these might be different categories. This might be people who come to 
uni by bus, those who come by car, and those who uh, walk to uni. We've got a frequency of each. Now, the thing about a bar chart for categorical data is those bars are typically separated out because each of those are separate and distinct categories. With numerical data, things are in an order from least number of visits to the doctor to the most, and they're fairly continuous. Uh, so therefore, we put the bars together to indicate that we've just got one category after the other. Just a small little detail that you have to actually, if you're going to use something like Excel, you've actually got to convince it to do your graph that way. One of the benefits of histograms is you, you can get some feel for how a distribution is what we call shaped. So in this case here, you can see straight away that because you can't go any go to the doctor any less than zero times, and because a lot of people went to the doctor zero times or just a very small number of times, you've got most of our data here, but then you've got this sort of tailing off in this direction here. So this distribution is actually an example of what we call a positively skewed distribution. Here's another one right here, where most of the data is down the bottom end, so you kind of get a, lots of data there, and then develops a little bit of a tail off to the right-hand direction. That's what we call positive skewness. So we've seen an example of that already. Something that might follow that pattern would be, for example, house prices. House price data has a pattern that if you go to a particular suburb, most of the houses are towards the cheap end of the range, um, cheap to middle range, so that's where most of the houses are. These are the really dodgy houses in the suburb. This is where the majority of houses are, which were all fairly similar in terms of the size of land that they've got and the quality of the house and all that kind of thing. Then you get a few people who've spent a lot of money building fancy houses. Perhaps they've got bigger blocks, and they re they can get you know really quite expensive. But there's not many of those, so the probability of getting one of those becomes quite small. So that's a typical positive skewed distribution. Many examples of that, actually. Uh, another example might be uh, wages or incomes. Most of us earn, you know, relatively low amounts, but there are a few really rich people who earn very large amounts. But as you go up to those extreme high income values, uh, the number of people in that category becomes pretty small. The other alternative is that we might have a negatively skewed distribution like this here, where most of the mass is there, and there's a few who are much, much below that kind of more common area. A little bit harder to think of negatively skewed distributions, but an example that, that I kind of observe sometimes is your exam results. Because you can't get more than 100%. Well, here's your person with 100%. You get a lot of a few people who get high distinctions, and then you get most people in that sort of 60 to 80% kind of range, distinctions and credits and, and a bunch of passes. And then as you go down, so there's not much sort of above that kind of bulk. Hardly anybody gets above 90%, for example very hard to get results like that. But then you get, as you go down this direction, quite a long tail where you get some people who just failed, got in the 40s, and you get a few who did pretty badly, got in the 30s, and the ones that gave up and got in the 20s or the teens and what have you, just down right at the bottom here. So you get a sort of long tail in that direction. And then the third category, which is neither positively skewed nor negatively skewed, is what we call a symmetric distribution. I say almost here because this graph is not perfectly symmetric. To think about a symmetric distribution, stick a mirror down the middle, and you should see things on the left and on the right being basically identical to each other. And it's pretty much the case here, nearly, but not 100%. So that's a typical symmetric distribution, and, and surprisingly, many distributions can be like that. If you if you get some data on um, you know, how much money people spend on a particular thing, you'll find there's, a, there's an average about here somewhere, and as you move away from the average, you get um, people spending more and um, people spending less, and they can tend to be just as likely to have people spending more, this much more, as there is this much less. So, and as you get further away from the mean, the likelihood of getting those sorts of values decreases towards zero in either direction at about the same rate, and that's what we mean by symmetric. So in terms of trying to capture a set of data, remember this is descriptive analytics, just get a feel for what the data is telling here. What we have here in tables of frequencies like this and then histograms and then some kind of words around to describe those histograms. There's a bit of a snapshot picture of, of the kinds of things you observe in data that gives you a feel for not just where the data is on average but how it's distributed around those kind of average values. And that is a good place for us to 
say thank you very much and we shall uh, think more about how we do that at other times. I uh, hope you uh, found that interesting and that's it for now.